Hey, y'all. Welcome back to the Purpose University podcast, your source of inspiration as you seek to create your best life and be your most authentic self. I am your host, Dr. Eve, and I am so glad that you have decided to join me at this time. If this is your first time tuning in, I want to say thank you for checking out the show, and I certainly hope you'll come back for more. So without further ado, let's get into it. So I am absolutely thrilled today to be sitting here talking with, I'm going to say the Jonathan Solomon. Jonathan is someone who I've had an opportunity to meet on social media through a mutual friend. He is a a native of Cleveland, Ohio. Jonathan, I have a question. So if I do the OH thing, what do you do? I O. What you mean? Ah! Okay. Okay. So I was up um, in Ohio last year at Ohio State, and I was like so blown when they had done. It. I was like, "Do what?" So yeah, you know what it is. <laughs> but that's Ooh, yeah. really cool. I love the pride. I love the pride. Jonathan here is a graduate of Langston University. He got his bachelor's in business administration. You know, he got that master's from Oklahoma University of Oklahoma in education, and now he is working on that PhD in higher education leadership um, at Indiana State University. So very cool. Currently, you know, directing the Upper Bound program at Howard Stowe State University. And he's an HBCU grad that is married and has the French Bulldog named Huncho. And I can't I can't leave this part out. He's a proud member of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. Yes, What's yes. going on, Jonathan? Look, you just so grand, man. You so grand. Oh man, thank you so much. I'm excited to be here today. I'm excited for this platform. I'm excited. I'm just excited. It's an exciting day. It, it is an exciting day. Yeah, look, I, look, I am really glad to have you. You are really on the move from everything that I've gotten to know about you and having read about you. Like, I'm just like, wow, your heart is really with doing the whole reaches we climb. Being somebody who has been, as I understand, in foster care, being someone who is a first generation college student, I am excited to hear your story. And actually, I don't even want to waste any more time. Please tell us about yourself. Who are you? What is your story? Absolutely. So thank you again. Um, so I have already been introduced. My name is Jonathan. Um, I was born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio, to a, a family, a pretty big blended family. I have 12 siblings, uh, most of which are age gap wise, much older than me. But I was born to parents, um, two hardworking parents who struggled with with drug addiction Mm -hmm. just my entire childhood and even until today. And so neither one of my parents graduated from high school. And so um, my reality in terms of education, while my parents tried to support me, they really didn't know how. And so me and my younger sister, who are closest in age, we grew up with each other. We went through a lot of the same things. And so we watched our parents struggle. Uh, We watched our parents struggle with their addiction. We were taken and put into foster care together. I remember the knock on our, our window one late night while we were living in an abandoned house. And for me, it was a knock of opportunity. And for my sister, you know, it was just something completely different being taken away from our family. But for me, I look back on that experience as that was the time when things became real for me in terms of, hey, this is a wake up call. We got to figure out what we're going to do. Even at a young age, even though I was in middle school, it was just like, what was next? And so I was lucky enough to be connected with great teachers and great mentors who believed in me. Like school had always been a refuge for me. And so I did well in school because it was an opportunity for me to fake the funk. Like I didn't, people at school didn't have to know that we were struggling, that I hadn't taken a a bath or a shower in two weeks because we didn't have water or that we didn't have food at home. Like it was my escape from my reality. And so, um, so yeah, I, I took advantage of foster care. I've made some great relationships. People showed me what could be. And so, um, I, I did that, ended up moving to California in high school and getting connected. And then I knew in terms of college, college was going to be an opportunity for me to really get away from, from all of those things and get away from my family and try to create this life that I knew that, that I could obtain if I just worked hard and stuck to it. And so I went on to Langston University. I got a football scholarship. Huh. I actually, it, it's a funny story. So I got on the Greyhound bus. I had a trash bag full of clothes, no money, no bedding for my, my college dorm, any of that. Um, didn't mm. even know, didn't even know that was something that you would need. Mm. Um, got to Oklahoma City, realized that Langston was an hour away. 
<laughs> down in Oklahoma City and just figured it out. And for me, you know, it was a scary time, but it was the moment that I had been waiting for. It was the opportunity to really take advantage of my life and, and create that life that I know that I wanted. And so that's just a little bit about my story, but I'm just really blessed to, to be here, blessed to be able to be doing the work that I do, um, working with students who come from similar backgrounds, working with students who might not necessarily have a similar story, um, but I'm able to, to walk them through how to take ownership over the things that have happened in their life and how to really be energized by those things and motivated to succeed. Mm, I like how you said to take ownership. Um, how do you teach them to take ownership? Well, first off, I think what I've learned to do is be really comfortable in sharing my story. And mm. so I believe in stories. I believe that there's power in experiences and we're able to, to figure out how we're all connected through our stories. And so a lot of the conversation that I have when I'm, when I'm talking with students I'm building relationships with them to the point where they're talking to me about some of their experiences, some of the things that they've gone through. And I'm able to say, I'm able to help link things together. People mm -hmm. don't understand how, a lot of times, how experiences that they've had are connected with things that are happening now. And so when you talk about taking ownership, just for example, like I have a student who came from a household where you know it was just not supportive of her educational dreams and she found a way to make her way to college and she's supporting herself and so i'm just like look how that experience has shaped the person that you are now and so i remember not understanding why i was going through the things that i was going through but at this mm. point i understand that you know, my, my purpose in life is really to be able to have conversations with people and help people through the things that they're going through because I'm taking ownership over my story and I'm saying this is what, even though it was traumatic, this is what has shaped the person that I am and I wouldn't be this person if I didn't go through those things. Mm, absolutely. So even with that, what would you say is the best advice that you've given to one of your students? The, the best advice that I would say that I've given to one of my students is just to be your authentic self. And so I think we live in a society where the rules are, are written for you, or that's how you perceive life to be, is that you have to look a certain way, you have to talk a certain way. When, when you're out in public, there's a certain way that you're supposed to act. And so I'm very big on inspiring my students to figure out who it is that they are, um, mm. not what society tells you that you need to be or not what others have told you that you need to be. So um, this whole notion of self-discovery, you know, and I think that college is such a crucial time for that because a lot of times this is your first time away from home. You're by yourself. You're figuring things out. And so it's a time for us to figure out who we are, not who we want to be for others or who others want us to be. But just really figuring out who you are, loving who you are, falling in love with the person that you are, the things that you've gone through, and, and really like taking heed to that and not going away from your morals or your values for anybody. So I, I would say that that's probably some of the best advice I've given. I like that. So on the flip side, what's the best advice you ever gotten from someone? <laughs> Man, so I've, I've gotten a lot of good advice. I would say for me, for my own development, the best advice I've gotten is probably from one of my students. And so I, my, my college experience, I feel like one of the things that was kind of ingrained in me was this whole notion of respectability politics. And so, hey, Jonathan, you have to look this way um, to get a job in this society. And hey, you have to do these certain things. You have to wear this. Your hair has to be cut. And so I remember um, I was working at Wayne State University and I had a student who was brilliant. He was from one of the worst performing schools in the city of Detroit, but he made his way to Wayne State. He had a 29 on his ACT, just a really good guy who a lot of people would say he was rough around the edges. And so hmm. he, he came into my office, I remember. He was just in some basketball shorts. He had this huge nappy fro. And he was just like, I want to be an RA. Like, I want to get involved. I want to do things at this university. And, you know, I, I'm kind of embarrassed to say, one of the things that we had a conversation about, just man to man, I was like, hey, you have to think about your image and your hair. Like, what are you going to do with your hair? And he read me for filth that day. Oh. And I'm so <laughs> grateful for it. He was just like, why do I have to do something to my hair, cut my hair? 
why do I have to fit into, you know, this this white supremacist um, notion of mm. it's supposed to look a certain way? And it really just, I was just like, wow. Like, my life has been defined by those types of things. And so it really mm. inspired me. Mm. That's when I decided to grow my hair out. Really? It, it was. I was inspired by one of my students um, to grow my hair out. And I just have really enjoyed this journey. Um, it means so much to me from just at first just growing it out and then getting it locked and that entire journey has been dope like it's been a, a journey of self-discovery it's been a journey mm. of falling in love with my blackness and understanding mm. what that means um, in lots of different spaces it's been a journey of you know with me growing understanding that I'm not welcome in some spaces or I'm not valued in some spaces and so what that means is that I have to figure out where I am going to be able to be where I can be my authentic self. And so that's mm. why I'm so I'm so grateful at this moment. I work at an institution where who I am is celebrated. The way that I look is mm. around. Um, and so that's why I've just been such a huge component and supporter of HBCUs. And, you know, I know there's not every place is like that, but where I am right now, it's celebrated. Like people love who I am. People are doing their own thing. I'm loving, I'm seeing locks, I'm seeing Bantu knots. And we're just like, this is this is our culture. This is who we are. And I was inspired by a student. So I think that's pretty dope. Absolutely. And I love that in the profession that you're in, as much as you hope to help others, others end up helping you like students like that. Students are the best thing in the world. <laughs> that's, Absolutely. That's, my, that's my opinion. I, I love, 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 love college students for sure. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. You touch on several times the idea of being your most authentic self. What would you say has been the hard part about being who you are? And when I say that, thinking about being first gen, thinking about being a black male, thinking about showing up as you as you are like can you tell us if there's ever been a place or a space where you've been rejected for being any of those things yeah so i've i've been in in many a spaces where i was just challenged um everything about me was challenged and so just to be transparent i've worked at places where it's been an issue and so i think even more recently, um, one of the last places I worked, um, and I've been, I'm, I'm always transparent and open with people. Um, I think that, you know, it helps us all get through things, but um, I was the only black man there working in this environment, and I just wasn't in an environment that was supportive of, of mm -hmm. black men or black students, and I was in a position where I was supposed to be advocating for those students and, and I'm advocating in spaces that they didn't know existed. And so um, just questions about appearance and skin and traditions and, you know, um, why why is it important for, for Black people to have a community in, in terms of students? Like, why is a Black Student Association important from the highest levels? And just questioning the things that are most important to us. And so, I, you know, it was really difficult in terms of feeling like I was the only person in that space on that level, in terms of administrators or staff, to be on that level and not feel like I have support on mm. that level. And so mm. a lot of times my, my strength came from conversations with students. And they they saw, like I didn't, I, I wasn't able to talk with them about everything that I went through, but they, they could see visually when I was struggling, you know, supporting mm. and advocating for them against something that is not necessarily for them. And so I think I've, I, I struggle in, in spaces like that I have traditionally. And I think what that has taught me is that before I walked into that space, I didn't, I really didn't believe that I could be myself completely in any space. And so when I left that place, I was just like, you know what, wherever I go next, I am gonna find a place that um, accepts me for me and where I don't have to explain my existence every single day. Mm. And so it, it has helped me, when, when you talk about being authentic and being your authentic self, it's helped me to keep that in mind. Like we, we say it a lot of times for our students, but are we practicing it for ourselves? Mm. So I needed, I needed that reminder that, hey, this is what you're teaching them. Now teach this to yourself. Mm. I love that. And, and this is, <laughs> this is because there's the aspect of already being first generation mm -hmm. and why 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 does that matter it matters because you already come to the table as a student as a scholar in in many circumstances feeling inadequate 
because yeah. of the lack of what you had when you were growing up I'm an adult and to overcome the hurdles but yet there's still other intersections of who you are that you have to deal with and so you just keep piling up piling up on these things to make you even feel like am I enough and when will it ever be enough so for you to have been able to navigate as a young black professional first generation male is something to be said about that because you are the example of you can do it you just got to figure out where you belong you got to figure yeah. out where you want it where you need it even I, I, I love that that you were transparent about it because the vulnerability would help other people to say well what is it that I need to make some changes because I am adequate I am enough and if y'all can't recognize it I'm gonna go somewhere else <laughs> yeah and that's, that's um, what it is <laughs> yes absolutely so thinking about um, let's kind of go back to your to college or at least when you graduated because you are now again you're a director of an upward bound program which is really big so from first gen to directing a program where you are really changing the lives of other possible first gens um, what was life like for you right when you finished school like did you have a plan did you know what was next Um, how did you navigate so I I thought I had a plan, but really I had no clue. Um, so <laughs> I knew that I wanted to go to grad school. Um, really didn't know what that looked like. And, and it's funny that I say that. Uh, we're well, not necessarily funny, but I never, in my educational journey, I've never stopped being a first gen. And so I was under this impression that, okay, when I get to college, yes, I'm a first gen. I'm going to figure out what resources I need to take advantage of. And then when I graduate college, I'm not a first gen anymore. No, I was a first gen master's student. I've been a first gen on the PhD level. And so there were just some certain things that I struggled with that I noticed that a lot of my classmates didn't struggle with. Mm. And so my journey after graduating with my bachelor's degree, I decided that I wanted to go and get a master's degree. And so I went on to the University of Oklahoma. And that first year at OU, while in the classroom, I was doing great. Um, I ended up graduating from OU with a 4.0. Outside hmm. of the classroom, I struggled because the community that I had before I got to OU, um, I didn't realize how important that was for my survival. And I didn't, I didn't realize how important those resources that were offered to me as a first gen, as a bachelor student, was important to my survival. And so, on the master's level, I you know I didn't necessarily have that that first year, and I didn't really understand why I was struggling at that level. Um, mm. But it took me. I got involved with the Black Graduate Student Association. Um, I got some really dope mentors at that level, um, faculty members of color, first gen faculty members who were able to kind of walk me through that journey. Um, that my second year as a master's student, it was just I was living my best life. Uh, it was great because I was connected at that level and I was enjoying what I was doing. But I think more than anything, I think that I walked out of my, my bachelor's degree with an understanding of what it meant to be first gen and understanding of what you need in terms of resources to be successful to go to college. And mm. so I, at that point, I knew that I was going to go get a degree and dedicate myself to advocating for first generation students. So that mm -hmm. we at the university level, you know, you're asking first gens to come to your university and you're offering them these opportunities to come. But when they're there, now it's our responsibility to take care of them. It's our responsibility mm -hmm. to offer the resources so that they can be successful at this level. And so I'm, I'm just all I'm really big on, you know, challenging the norms of universities. And so um, if, if we're going to recruit these students, we got to make sure it's our business that they graduate. And so, yeah, I knew I, I took ownership over that, you know, with graduating with my bachelor's and I knew that that was going to be the goal. And so that's what led me to working with Upper Bound. Upper Bound was what changed my life. When I went into foster care, one of my teachers who was a foster parent, she signed me up for Upper Bound and didn't even tell me. Mm. She did not tell me. Um, and she knew that I wanted to go to college, but she also knew that I was going through some things. And this that summer, the first summer when I went to Upper Bound, her name was Miss Black, and she passed away from cancer that summer. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really traumatic. But what stuck with me was that, hey, this is something she signed me up for. She believed in me. And so Upper Bound showed me that, you know, college could be reality. Like, I had never been on a college campus. I had never taken classes or anything like that at that level. I did that at a very young age. And so when I got to school, it was just like, oh, 
like I've been here before. Mm -hmm. I've been here before. Nobody's going to tell me that I don't belong here. I'm going to make this place my own. And so mm -hmm. that's why I feel like it's important for me to be in that space at this point, working with Upward Bound, um, creating that experience for these students so that when they get to the university level, they can say, hey, you know, this was created for me. I'm supposed to be here. Mm, I love that. I'm supposed to be here. What a proclamation to make. I'm supposed to be here. You can't Absolutely. get away, get rid of me. I'm so you're going to help me get through this thing, too. So, oh, yeah. Man. Um, so thinking about being here and being here and being present um, and living your best life, what does that look like to you? How would you coach a student or even giving advice to a friend about living their best life? So there's a couple of different things that I would say about that. Um, I think that what, what has helped me get to a place where I feel like I'm living my best life, um, I have lots of struggles. There's things I still struggle with, but I think that I've decided that in terms of the things that I'm going to do in the future, everything is going to be mission focused. And so mm. I am... I'm understanding why I was put on this earth. I'm understanding that I have a gift and mm. I have a, I have a story and I'm going to use that to help others who are in similar situations, who might not be in similar situations, but I'm going to I'm going to use my story to help first gen students navigate this journey. And I'm going to do that by Let's talk about the things that I didn't have at that time. Let's talk about things that you say are important to know um, and, and things that you don't know that are important to know at this level. And so I would say really figuring out what it is that you're on this earth for. Like, what are your passions? What, what's your purpose? How can you put that into, how can you combine those things into a career? How can you combine those things into, you know, the work that you do? Whether Maybe maybe your career isn't that, but what are you doing outside of that? Like, how are you impacting your community? Um, those types of things. And so, when talking about living my best life, I think that it's important. I'm I'm a man who believes in service, and mm. so it's it's always what are you doing for others? And so I'm always looking to do something to better my community, to better this place for first gens, all those types of things. So just looking to be a service minded person. Absolutely. So even thinking about serving and doing for the community what are some things that you're looking to do service wise um, in the future to be able to continue to help your community well i've been uh, so i'm really super passionate about hbcus and i'm passionate about black male student success and so yes. um currently i'm working on my phd at indiana state university and hopefully <laughs> when i have the conversation with my advisors and they approve i'm just speaking to existence <laughs> <laughs> um, my research is, is going to combine those two. So nice. um, okay. currently I'm the advisor for the Black Male Initiative at Harris Stowe State University. And so a lot of what we do, we're providing that mentorship. We're providing the academic assistance. We're providing the community for, for Black male students here on this campus to be able to thrive here. You know, not just come here and, and make it through, but to thrive. And so a lot of the work that that I've been doing for the community stems from them. And so we've had conversations about, you know, we talk about we want to do community service. What what type of community service are we going to do? Like, what are ways that we can get in our communities and impact the lives of people? Not just the campus cleanup, but what are, like, how can we do more? Mm -hmm. And so I think I've been using BMI for short as an avenue to really do a lot of the things that I'm passionate about while also helping students understand their own passions within this organization too. And so just a lot of work through there. I'm new to St. Louis and so I've still just been trying to figure out what are some organizations that are our mission that connect with me on a mission level. But I, I would say that just to work through Harris Stowe and to work through BMI and to work with my trio students is a way that I've been connecting to the community. I love that. Absolutely love that. So as we're, you know, wrapping things up, I'm curious to know what's next for you. Ooh, what is next for me? <laughs> <laughs> not all at once now, not too many goals, no, but really what's next for you? Because I know you're working on this PhD and you're going, you know, kick ass and take yes. names with that. I'm just going to, that's, yes. that's how it is. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say 
th- this PhD journey has been something else. So yeah, I'm just, I've never, just to be honest with you, and this is something I always tell my students too, I don't like school at all. Um, I love learning, I love engaging, I love talking, but I hate school. And it's always been like that for me. And so this journey, the PhD, one of the things that I was motivated by was the fact that neither, neither one of my parents graduated from high school. And so I told myself, if I have the opportunity, I'm going to go all the way out and finish this whole thing. And so um, it's also an opportunity for me to show students that you don't necessarily have to like something to finish it. And so while I, like, I'm, I'm enjoying the conversation um, and all those things with this journey, I don't necessarily like school. <laughs> so I would say the PhD is next for me. I think it's going to open doors for me to have even more conversations about identity development and intersectionality of all of us. And just from a, a teaching standpoint, I'm thinking about wanting to be an adjunct. Um, I have Ooh. dreams of being a, a vice president of student affairs or maybe an HBCU president. And so I think, you know, I have a lot of things that I'm thinking about, but how do I say this? So I have a lot of, uh, of of future goals, but I also think that I'm figuring it out. And there's never a point in life where we just got to figure it out. And so I'm riding this wave. I'm going where God tells me that I need to be. And I'm going to try to impact as many lives as possible while doing it. So that's that's my goal. Mm, absolutely. I love that. I love that you're, you're really, like I said, service oriented because everything you said has been about helping others and changing lives. And I'm like, yes, that's wow, it. I didn't even realize um, that. <laughs> yeah, you got, you got, hey, all right. See, I'm the purpose professor. No, <laughs> but really, yeah. it's being able to hear what you're saying and, and yours is you are truly out to help others. It's not, it sounds like to me, nothing that you do is about you. And that's what makes a difference because you're fully committed to uplifting and serving other people so that they may be their best. So yeah. I commend you for that. Yeah, so fi- final question. What is the one thing that you want to leave as a message to listeners? What do you want for them to take away from from you that they can chew on for life? Hmm. So I would say one of the things that I would just leave with people, um, just again, the, the importance of figuring out why you were put here. You know, that, that journey doesn't happen overnight. Um, mm-hmm. For many, it, it's a lifetime. But there's, there's nuggets, there's things that happen that lead you to remember or, or to realize what it is you're here for. And so I would say seize those. And, 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 and during that journey, just taking ownership over who you are and being who you are 100% and not folding for anybody. Um, mm. and, and remembering to, to occupy spaces that affirm who you are. Mm. Absolutely. I love that. Well, Jonathan, you have been a pleasure to have on the show today. And I have learned from you and I'm taking from you again to not lose sight of helping others um, and not to get so caught up in the idea that I don't belong or any any person for that matter, that you don't belong somewhere. You always belong. I love to be reminded of that Um, Mm -hmm. and about being authentic. So you are incredible. And until next time, my friend. Thank you again. Thank you. Oh, gosh, you're so very welcome. Again, I want to thank you for tuning in. Before you go, just a few things to note. Uh, First and foremost, let's get connected on Instagram and or LinkedIn. You can find me at E-V-E-H-U-D-S-O-N-P-H-D on both social networks. Don't forget to head over to check out my site at www.evehudsonphd.com. And if you should decide to purchase a book or apparel just for listening to this podcast, you get 10% off of your order. Just use the code podcast when you check out. Last, but certainly not the least, in all that you do, remember to be resilient, authentic, and intentional. I'm out.